Good evening, everyone. My name is Sam, and on behalf of BookSoup, I'd like to thank you all for joining us for tonight's event and Q&A with Namina Forna and Amelie Wenzhou here to discuss their books, The Gilded Ones and Red Tigress. Today is Independent Bookstore Day, so um, this is a day to celebrate independent bookstores around the country. So thank you for the love we've received on social media and in store, if you've joined us locally. And um, we're excited to host Namina and Amelie, because we did two pre-signed book orders uh, campaigns with both of them. So if you click on the green button below, you can actually participate in Independent Bookstore Day and get signed copies of both books um, through that button. And it'll redirect you to our website where you can finish the checkout process and you can do that at any time. I know we still have stock, which is exciting. So um, please support independent bookstores and our authors tonight by doing that. And we'll be hosting more virtual events in the near future, which you can learn more about from our website by following us on social media, signing up for our email newsletter, or even following us right here. And past events are also available on our YouTube channel. Um, tonight's event will end with a Q&A. And to submit a question, please use the ask a question button at the bottom of the screen. And if you see a question on the list that you'd like for our speakers to answer, you can click the like button to bump it up in the queue. And we will try to answer as many questions as time will allow. And please also feel free to um, engage with our authors in the chat area to the right. With that said, let me introduce our guests for this evening. Namina Forna has an MFA in film and TV production from USC School of Cinematic Arts and a BA from Spelman College. She now works as a screenwriter in Los Angeles and loves telling stories with fierce female leads. The Gilded Ones is her debut novel. You can visit her on Twitter at Namina Forna and on Instagram at Namina.Forna. Thank you for being with us tonight. We're so excited to have you. And our other guest tonight, Amelie Wenzhou, was born in Paris and grew up in Beijing in an international community. Her multicultural upbringing instilled in her a deep love of global affairs and cross-cultural perspectives. She seeks to bring this passion to her stories, crafting characters from kingdoms in different corners of the world. She attended college in New York City, where she now lives. Amelie is the author of Blood Air and Red Tigress. And without further ado, I'm going to turn the camera over to our guest tonight. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the presentation. Thank you both so much for being with us tonight. Thanks, Sam. Yeah, yeah. Super excited to be celebrating Indie Bookstore today with you, Namina, and with BookSoup, of course. Hey, hey. Wait, how did we meet? Like, do you remember? Yes, I do. Very clearly, because I was so excited for the Gilded Ones. Um, it was at either Y'all West or Y'all West. West. Okay, y'all fest because, and then you showed up in this beautiful, beautiful gown with like, complete with like gloves and stuff. And I was like, oh my gosh, I love her already. <laughs> I'm so excited for her book. Um, and then since then, I think that was one of the last chances people had to have a major book event before the pandemic in the next year. That was the only book event that I had in person. Oh my gosh, how, I know, so my debut came out right after that in November 2019, and I got to have an in-person, a few in-person book events. How has it been just launching a book throughout the pandemic? Um, I think before that, let's tell people about our books, like, True. <laughs> yeah, right? Before we dive in, let's let people know. Um, you want to tell us about Blood Air? Sure, yeah. Um, so let's see. Blood Air um, is a book about a um, Russian inspired empire and an exiled heir who has to partner with a cunning con man to resolve the systemic corruption in her empire and interrogate kind of the system of governance um, throughout. So, Red Tigress is the sequel, and it was also a pandemic baby. Um, and yeah. I mean, they're so pretty together. Thank you. Yeah. And let's learn about the Gilded Ones. Um, so the Gilded Ones um, is a young adult fantasy novel. I always like to say it's like basically if the Dora Malahi from Black Panther were stuck in the world of The Handmaid's Tale and we're like, let's burn everything down. Oh um, so basically uh, it's set in a super patriarchal world called Oterra, mm -hmm. where there's a group of um, women who are faster and stronger than regular people and bleed gold. And because of this, people think that they're demons. And so the idea is you see one, you figure out how you, you, you kill it. 
Um, but then actual demons come into this world and humans are like, wait a second. Uh, I think we need these girls to fight these monsters. And so they offer them a choice, fight or die. My main character, Deka, decides to fight and in doing so goes on an adventure that changes her life. I absolutely loved it. And I just, I loved how you interrogated like women being labeled as pure or impure based on, you know, how they're born supposedly set in a patriarchal society. Um, but yeah, how, I'm curious how the journey was for you because I remember both of our books got delayed because of the pandemic. Obviously yours was a debut, so it was totally different, but. Are we talking book journeys in general or pandemic journeys? Because this is a, we can do, we can do both. What do you think? I'd love to learn about your book journey in general. I read about, um, I read your article on Elle um, about immigrating from Sierra Leone and it was honestly super inspiring and I could see a lot of that in The Gilded Ones and I just loved that. Because we're both internationals, that's what it exactly. <laughs> um, so for my journey, so um, I was born and raised in Sierra Leone, West Africa. Um, Sierra Leone is extremely patriarchal, much like America. Um, and in Sierra Leone, um, People practice uh, female genital mutilation. In fact, 90% of women in Sierra Leone have had this happen to them, and it's really horrific. Um, so I grew up sort of this with, with this as a specter, um, you know, and like, thankfully, my parents were always like um, over my dead body. But like, I always knew that because I was a woman, um, certain things might happen to me. And also, by the way, I grew up during the Sierra Leone Civil War. So that was, it was just different levels of violence. Um, and what I found fascinating sort of about um, with the, especially like with the things that happened to women in Sierra Leone and particularly with the FGM, um, I found it interesting that the people who kept pushing it to young girls were usually their moms or their sisters or their aunts, you know, older women that they trusted who um, and it wasn't that like these women were like being evil or anything like that. It was, this is what you need to do to be pure, right? This is what you need to do to get married, have a kid and be a functioning part of society. And I always thought this was wrong, but every time I thought this, I would tap down that question and be like, no, like, why are you having questions about this? This is what everybody believes. Um, you know, it's not okay. Um, I come to America thinking that like America is going to be sort of more equal and, uh, of course, like I quickly realized that it's it's different levels of the same thing. Cause like I grew up in Georgia, um, like where there were, like I remember my classmates going to purity balls and things like that. And like all this talk over um, rights over your body and things of that nature. And I was like, huh, this is actually sort of like Sierra Leone, but I didn't have the words um, to sort of explain why I felt that these things were not okay until I went to college. And there I took women's studies classes. And that's when I was like, oh, I've been bamboozled. This is a system, um, you know? And so at that time, like, I was like, I want to write a book um, that sort of explains and makes it easier for not just girls, but boys and gender diverse people, just everyone to understand what it means to live in like a patriarchal society, who suffers, who doesn't. Um, and to just sort of see the system easier because it took me all of those years of just questioning and then doubting myself to be like, oh, this is actually a problem. And so that's where uh, the idea for The Gilded Ones came about was I was I set out to create a book to sort of explain these things. Um, and I, sort of, I got the idea for uh, The Gilded Ones um, in 2012. Um, and I wrote it, um, the first draft of it, the first couple of drafts of it. And I sent it off into the universe. And like, I was in film school at the time. And I was like, I'm an amazing writer. I'm getting all these awards, you know, like it is my time. Because I'd, I'd wanted to be um, an author since undergrad. I'd written since undergrad. And I tried to uh, query books since undergrad and it went nowhere. But with The Gilded Ones, I was just like, you know, it's so like, it's such a level, um, at such a level, there's no way. But when I sent it out, it was sort of like, it wasn't crickets, it was uh, agents who would be like, oh, this is, this is a, you know, this is a good idea, but does she have to be, you know, does she have to be black? 
Um, Cause remember in 2012, like the, the, in the industry, there was the, the assumption that black people didn't sell books and that people would not read books by black people. Um, so I sort of hit against that wall until I was just like, this is not gonna open up for me. Maybe this is not my time. Let me go on to the next project. And it was only um, until 2018 when I saw the promo, like the excitement that uh, the Black Panther promos were getting, that I was like, oh, this is the time. So I like call my agent. I'm like, I have this book. Um, I need to do a page one rewrite, started from scratch because what was, you know, what was acceptable um, in 2012 was not the same in, you know, 2018, like times had changed. And I also like, I hadn't written it as, aggressively as I'd want it to. So I was like, you know, um, I have this idea. And she's like, oh, that's amazing. How fast can you get it to me? I'm like, give me two months. I get it to her in a month and a half um, and it sells the day that it goes out um, or rather gets an offer the day that it goes out. And so that was the, and that when I was so excited because like at this point I'd spent, it took me 12 years to get an agent. Um, and I was just like, finally, my dreams are coming true. Da, 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 I'm going to be an author, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was supposed to debut May 26th of 2020. Uh, and I remember uh, I was all getting ready. I was like getting the jitters and whatever. And then March hits and we start seeing things and we're like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. And I got a call from my agent. Um, it is a very nice call. She's just like, you know, um, given that we don't understand what's happening, we've decided to push the book. And of course, I fell into like a grand depression where it's just like, oh, no, the pandemic happened because because the universe didn't want me to publish my book. Oh. I'm so, so dramatic. But um, I am so grateful that it got pushed uh, because it did give us time to figure out the thing, um, to figure out this new time. And uh, yeah, so it came out this year. I'm super excited. And that is the story of the Gilded Ones. And that was sort of long and boring, but you know. I loved that. And I'm so, so glad it's out. And I'm so glad that it got the attention that it absolutely deserved. Um, whereas like May, I know it was like a frantic, hectic time for publishing. Um, and yeah, I, I just love the story you've woven and just learning about your background and like your the themes from your own you know, from yourself, um, it's just super, super inspiring. So thank you for writing this. Oh, tell me, okay, so tell us about Blood Air and then like, tell us about the whole, the, is it a trilogy or is it a duology? It's a trilogy. Okay, so yeah. tell us about the first two books you got. Yeah, so the, my journey was, it started a bit later in 2014. Um, and it was interesting because a couple of things happened. So I had just, um, so I had just like graduated from college and I was like, you know, like now I'm working full time. I kind of want to give writing a shot. Like I just never thought like there were very few, if any Asian authors and in general, like people of color, authors of color in the industry back then. So I was like, I don't know if I can, I'm literally from China. I don't know if I can do this, but let me try it. Um, and that winter, I met um, one of the most important people in my life, my fiance, and he is Chinese American. And I learned about his family history, which is that he, the reason he was brought to the United States was as an, a coolie. Um, his ancestors were brought over as coolies or indentured laborers back during the whole um, gold rush and every and the US was creating the Trans-Pacific Railway, I believe. So I looked into this whole history and I was like, I've just never heard about this before. And it extends to my own homeland in the modern day eras. There are a lot of, this is a huge scenario that's gone just under media coverage, no government recognition. So I was like, you know, this is something specific that I want to interrogate in my books um, in a fantasy world. And that's what I wrote into it. At the same time, a lot of Blood Air is me grappling with my identity as a Chinese citizen uh, living in the US, especially as I was writing it throughout uh, some political changes in 2016. And it was, it's it hasn't been an easy time and it's, gotten increasingly hard, um, unfortunately. But a lot of 
this deals with feeling like an outcast and feeling like you don't belong in a society that doesn't want you and still persevering nevertheless um, as well. It's super, super multicultural in that it deals with a lot of interrogating your own homeland um, and facts that you might not have known, systemic corruption. Um, and it's something that I'm hesitant to voice out um, as an international citizen. But so what Anna goes through is a lot of just things very personal to me. And so that's why I set out to interrogate in Blood Air. Um, I think one of the most important characters in it to me is this East Asian inspired assassin girl that I wove in towards the very end of it because back in 2014 and 2012, as you said, it was a very different landscape and I just hadn't seen like people who look like me in, in YA fantasies. But at the very last moment, I was like, if I'm writing a book about things important to me, my homeland and my identity, I would love to weave in something, someone who looks like me. So this girl, her name is Lynn, and she is now a POV character in Red Tigress. And she um, is learning to fight back against all the systems of oppression um, that, have, that she has been brought into. So I think Blood Air, that's a lot, but Blood Air seeks to tackle these issues. Um, and the publication journey. So I started writing in 2014, towards the end of 2014, and I wrote towards the end of 2017. I wrote multiple drafts and I actually dug up my first draft and it was, it was really bad. <laughs> I'm so glad that um, I waited to query. Um, this was actually the first book I queried because I just didn't know if I could do something like this ever. And then I remember a an agented author read it for me and she was like, I love it. I think you should go out with it. And that's when I knew. So um, I got an agent towards the end of 2017 and we sold it within a few weeks of submissions. Um, so very luckily I didn't have to have the whole submission anxiety. And, and then yeah, it came out in, towards the end of 2019. So super lucky um, and super just happy to be here writing stories. And were there like any bumps on the way um, in terms of publication, like in the pandemic, like? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so like you, uh, like the Gilded Ones, Red Tigress was pushed back a couple months. It wasn't as long as the Gilded Ones, I remember. Um, it was meant to come out November, 2020. Oh, hold on. Yeah, November 20, I'm getting my dates confused. November 2020, um, and it got bumped to March 2021, which at, at the time I was like, oh God, this is forever. I'm never gonna get it published. Um, and then now it's out and it's been out for over a month. Um, but luckily it's not my debut, um, it's my sequel. So I at least got to experience some in-person events before everything closed down. Um, I can't wait to it. I can't wait to have in-person events. I know. <laughs> yeah. Um, but by the way, um, to everyone watching, watching, I have a couple of things going on. One is my lovely Thugnificent will not stay still. <laughs> he is just doing a lot right now. Um, and the second is I just got my second COVID vaccine, so I'm a bit... Um, a little bit calmer. <laughs> yeah, I guess that's a way to put it. <laughs> you're doing super super coherent like I was not coherent um during my after my vaccine shot like I was a mess so I'm I'm super impressed that you're actually I'm holding it together. I'm holding it together. <laughs> but it yeah. helps that like Miffy is literally biting my fingers at every turn or she was like running over there and eating things and I was like what's happening <laughs> <laughs> she's the real star of the show She's the real star of the show. Um, but I actually wanted to ask you a question that I found fascinating. Um, and, and I'm trying to figure out how to pose this. So like with your main char with your main character, um, why did you make the choice uh, for it to be set in the world that it did and with the character to be the um, race that, that um, you did? Yeah, um, so it's not something that let's see as a chinese citizen um it's difficult to interrogate aspects 
uh, in the real world. Um, and so I just wanted to set it somewhere that is some somewhat politically neutral. Um, and it's very hard for me to say, but I just wanted to interrogate some things that were happening, but not extremely overtly. Um, uh, I won't repeat. <laughs> but, oh God, oh um, yeah, and with Anna, she, there's, it's just always, so I was born in France and mm -hmm. I was raised in a very international community. And my identity has always been something that's been, I've just questioned it because when I was small, I was like, oh, I'm French. And then it became, okay, I'm Chinese, but all my peers are, you know, from other places around the world. And I, and the, the school and all the pop culture we were exposed to were very Western, like British, American, European. So it's been something that I've grappled with. Um, and so I think making Anna reflect the kind of multicultural upbringing that I personally had was something that was very close to me. Um, yeah. It feels like you've had a very third culture. Well, that's like what I consider myself. I consider myself a third culture person. I love um, that high five. <laughs> oh God, third culture. Yeah. I grew up between like Sierra Leone, some of England, um, America. Um, and I would like travel between like Sierra Leone, like I do the uh, Africa, Europe, um, you know, America sort of triangle and always be in different countries. So all my friends were always elsewhere and we'd see each other in like middle places like Tunisia. <laughs> and that's how I'd beat up with my friends. I love that. I feel like I just find myself as a diaspora and third culture kid. And yeah. I feel like it's a very small slice of the population yeah. and it's it's like hard because I'm not completely I'm not Asian American I am not completely like Chinese solely Chinese um so it's just somewhere always balancing in between um and I think that's in my work as well like there's um a British inspired kingdom in the sequel and we are going to a East Asia inspired empire in book three um so it's kind of like growing up as a third culture kid, like elements that come into play, so. So one of the things that I um, loved about your book was the magic system. Like, I just thought that was so cool. How did you come up with that? Like, how did you, can you like tell us about the magic system and like how, and if it's this stuff has changed in book two that you can spoil for us? Yeah, so I I think it was, I when I gave, so Anna has a, like an affinity to blood. So the people in the world of blood air, they some people have connections to certain elements, whether physical or metaphysical around them. Like it can be to emotions or to, you know, I don't know, wood or stone. And in her case, she is a super rare blood affinite, which means she can control people's blood. And this means that she is, she has, she's really powerful, um, but also that she's labeled a monster. Um, and I think, I don't know what I was thinking when I came up with that specific power, but I was just like, I really need um, her to be super powerful and for her to be an outcast as well. And I was like, what's cooler than being able to control the very makeup of someone's body? Um, I think it was inspired by a lot of just frustration I had with some political situations and changes uh, back then. Um, but yeah, that, yeah. I just wanted to make her a terrifying person who could just really kick ass and fight. <laughs> um, and then I, one of the things that I love about just weaving multiple worlds into this, um, there is a Russian inspired world, a British inspired world, and in a Chinese East Asia inspired world. And the mythologies within um, just gets bigger and bigger and you see that they start to interweave. So these Aphanites are viewed in different angles um, in different places in the world. And this was inspired by something I read, um, which is that in multiple religious mythos around the world, there have been allusions to similar events happening. So the great flood um, that Noah's Ark um, was a part of actually happened in Chinese mythology at around the same time 
And it was, it just seems all interconnected. So that's something I really wanted to weave into the structure of this world in that magic is interpreted in different ways, but it all boils down to the same elements. So yeah, I just wanted to make a monster who would fight for us and who isn't actually the monster that society labels her. Um, yeah, but like you, I loved the magic system in the Gilded Ones and I, I just loved the world you brought us into and how it's inspired by Sierra Leone or West African um, societal structures. So I would love to hear more about that system and how you came up with it. Um, I think it's sort of really fascinating that both of us like have magics, um, part of our magic systems deal with blood, but it, it seems we come at it from, um, well, I'm not sure if it's a completely different way. For me, um, so basically uh, in the Gilded Ones, there's a group of girls who are known as Alaki, and Alaki is a word uh, from Sierra Leone, which oh. literally means useless, right? Um, so these girls, um, like I like in the in the world of the story means um worthless or unwanted um and basically these girls uh they are faster and stronger than regular people um they bleed gold and they also have only one way they can die sort of like an achilles heel so it's like you can kill a girl until you figure out how a girl dies you can kill her several times and she'll just keep coming back um, but the reason why I was fascinated with gold, why I chose the blood, um, the golden blood was because I, what I wanted to talk about was the commodification of women's bodies, i.e. Um, the way how we tend to reduce women um, to sort of like a monetary commodity, right? Mm -hmm. um, so like women are oftentimes viewed um, according to their youth attractiveness and all of these things. Um, and I really wanted to talk about that. So I was like, what's a way that you could like literally make a metaphor? And I was like, oh, just make them bleed gold because literally there's the metaphor in this world. Like some of these girls are being bled for their gold, you know? Um, so that was one. And of course there's way more to the magic system, but I can't go into detail there. Um, but so that was one way that I wanted to talk about things, but in terms um, of the world. So I um, am fat, when I grew up in Sierra Leone, um, basically my dad and my grandmother um, would tell me a lot of stories to sort of distract me from what was going on with the war and stuff. And um, I, it took me some time to realize that the stories like that my father was telling me were actually uh, true histories of um, ancient African civilizations, right? So he told me about things like um, the walls of Benin, which um, are in Benin, Nigeria. They were once four times the great wall, size of four times the size of the Great Wall of China. What? Go circle Great Britain like sixteen times or seventeen times, I believe. Um, so and they're there. Um, but like nobody knows about them because in the 1800s, the Brit the British um, basically uh, stormed Benin, destroyed the city and stole the Benin bronzes, which are some of the most uh, beautiful works of, uh, of uh, beautiful African work artworks from antiquity. So nobody knows about that, right? Um, or like for, or other things like the, um, the ruins of old Zimbabwe or the castles um, in Gondar, Ethiopia, like things that are, that when I, when I came to America, I forgot these stories. Um, and then when I started to think of the world of the Gilded Ones, um, I tried to imagine um, a fantastical African past. Um, and all I could imagine were naked people in huts. And that was when I realized, oh, Namna, your mind's being colonized because like you grew up in Sierra Leone. You've seen, you know, like you've seen that you have a glorious history, but like when you think about things now, all you can think about is this, and that's a problem. So I went back and I did my research because um, I think I tend to think that um, the best fantasy comes from um, a, a foundation of reality. Um, so I did a lot of research, um, learning about all these cultures and civilizations again. And then I, I tossed them aside and created a world based on my understanding of these things. And so that's sort of how I came up with the world. And like also um, in the capital city, um, Sierra Leone is our free town where I grew up is, it's hills on the coast. 
it is on the coast. It's a tropical rainforest. It's gorgeous. It's very beautiful. So when I was approaching like the um, capital city in my book, I wanted to have a place that was like hills and water and just gorgeous. Like I really wanted to have, even though this was, this is make no mistake, by the way, um, people like all the trigger warnings for my book, because my book is violent. It, <laughs> it is very violent. Okay. Um, but um, I, I lost my train of thought. You're talking about hills. Um, oh, on yeah. <laughs> well, anyway, um, I just wanted to have like a gorgeous world, even though it's a dark world. And so um, that's how I approached uh, the Gilded Ones. And this one is doing a lot and climbing across the sofa <laughs> like she's a cat. You're not a cat, Mitty. That's not how things work. Her name cat. is Mitten. Her, okay, so her name is Thugnificent. Oh. <laughs> but we decided to shorten it to Niffy because, Aww. you know, Thugnificent is a mouthful. And if you <laughs> want uh, Boondocks, you'll get the reference. <laughs> Like Namana, why would you name the dog that? And I was just like, because she's, she's small and she's pretty, therefore she must be a thug. <laughs> I love that. I I actually loved how we both took the aspect of like something related to blood and then made something monstrous out of that. And I especially loved how you took gold blood, but made it and made these girls like so much stronger, more powerful than normal humans, right? But they're like treated basically as like you said useless um so i guess and deka she she fights against this she is such a strong character and and a strong female character so how did you go about crafting this and how did you go about having her i guess not fall into stereotypes while you know fighting the patriarchy basically so the character of deka came from a dream uh, when I was at Spelman College, um, an undergrad, I would have recurring dreams of a girl in golden armor, um, sort of walking slow motion, like up a battlefield, swords in hand, and she like jumps up in the air and the dream cuts out. And I was just like, I don't know who that is, but she's sort of awesome. And I want to <laughs> write a book about her. And then I also like had, you know, the idea of writing a book about the patriarchy. So I was like, oh, this is the character, this book, go. Um, but in terms of Deka, um, it's funny. In hindsight, I realized that The Gilded Ones is not the book of my heart. Because um, you know, authors always say that this is the book of my heart. No, this is the book of my rage. Because I was a very, very angry person. Even up until my 20s, I was extremely angry. Um, because I would look and I would see that things were unfair. Um, you know, just um, being a woman, being a black woman, being an immigrant, being like I and, and I didn't know how to voice these things or how to. So I wrote a book to sort of talk about what it means to be in a world where um, you are not wanted. You know, you're not seen, you're not welcomed, you're not wanted. And so Deka is sort of like my my way to get into that. Um, and when I originally wrote the book in 2012. Um, Deka was a very different character in that, you know, she was sort of more Buffy-like in that she came out the womb questioning, you know, and she was like ready to fight the patriarchy, blah, blah. She's like, this is BS. This is da, da, da. But when I approached it again um, in 2018, um, I realized, wait, this is, this is a trope rather than a character. Because growing up in Sierra Leone and just growing up as I did, one of the things that I recognize is that when you grow up in a world like that, number one, there's the amount of trauma and gaslighting um, that makes you doubt yourself on a fundamental level. So even when you're asking questions, you you feel bad, you feel guilty for asking questions. You blame yourself for asking questions because you're like, I should be okay with this. It's me who's wrong, not the world, right? Um, and so when I came back to the book, I was like, oh no, she needs to, we need to like reconsider this character because she can't come out the womb already questioning or whatever, because like what she wants is she wants to belong to society. She wants to fit in. And in fact, she has no other outlets. Like, you know, like, it's not like she can leave the village and go elsewhere. No, like she only has this one place. So she has to believe in everything and conform. And because of that, 
um, the way that I approached the character changed in that Deka like has to go through this process of slowly unpacking all of the things that she's learned and realizing, oh, I've been bamboozled. So it was sort of like when I, you know, in my 20s was like, oh, I've been bamboozled. Um, that's what it, and by the way, I love that word. It's just, it rolls up. <laughs> I love head. it too. It's sort of round, you know, like, <laughs> um, but yeah, so that's sort of why I wrote the character the way that I did was because I really wanted to examine the trauma um, and the repercussions of what it is um, when you grow up in a world like that. Um, and I um, and I have the same question for you. And also, by the way, um, if you guys have any questions, please drop them in the chat so we can start like answering um, any audience questions you might have. So. Yeah, I, I, I love that. I'm just like, I'm such a fan, first of all, and just hearing you talk about the themes in that book, like, it's just so it's just, I just love hearing about it. Um, you, girl. <laughs> um, so for Anna, I identified with how you said, it's not the book of my heart, it's the book of my rage. Um, and I thought that it was so interesting how both Deka and Anna went about like they want to fit into society and they want to accept what society, you know, labels them as and they they, they are exactly yeah so a lot of unpacking of you know concepts that have been pre established and kind of brainwashed into Anna, for example, and I think this reflect a lot of this reflected like my own journey um in balancing you know such opposing viewpoints um from my country of my home country and the country i'm currently living in um and a lot of just interrogating like why is this something that i have never heard about why is this something that i had never recognized before and now I have to do something about it. So Anna's journey was a lot about that and combining a, a frustration of kind of powerlessness that I felt just seeing a lot of political events unfurl in this country um, in the past <laughs> years. I love how you say this so euphemistically and so... <laughs> I know, yeah. um, trying yeah, to keep like, like positive on indie bookstore day. Um, but yeah, I think, I think like Anna is absolutely a creation of my rage. Um, and I, I think I gave her fearful powers just so she can, you know, kick ass and fight back for when at times, like I can't even vote in this country. And at times when I just felt so angry and helpless, you know, she was there channeling me. And I think just going to the f strong female protagonists, um, I thought, I love how you said like, oh, the typical like Buffy, like going all out, it's it's a trope. Um, and it's something that I have personally not identified with um, throughout like reading why his uh, YA fantasy, you see so many like of these powerful and sassy, like loud uh, women. And I love that, but I just personally was like, I don't think I'm one of those people. And so, while Anna is very much, you know, like I'm gonna go out fighting and questioning, um, my other protagonist, Lynn, is a quieter girl. She's East Asian and she, I think she very much embodies a lot of my culture and my upbringing, but she doesn't sacrifice her strength. She is strong in her silence and she never hesitates to act on what she thinks is right but she's not the typical like you know like strong female like i'm gonna go and you know like mouth off or whatever um and so i think i loved writing getting to write two different female protagonists and approaching their strength in different ways um so yeah i think yeah that's that's on strong female protagonists in these and books. would you um say that you identify more with lynn than you do with anna or yeah, absolutely. It's it's so interesting. And I'd love to hear about you and Deka too, because I people are like, which of the characters do you have the hardest time writing? And it's it's actually Anna because she's just she's extreme, she's like kind of the polar opposite of how I am. She's irrational, she's hot headed, um, and she's just super like she'll like pack a punch kind of. Um, whereas I'm 
you know, more diplomatic. I think things through and I'm just like, I'm more of the Ramson in these books um, or the Lynn in these books than I am Anna. So I think, yeah, personally growing up, I identify way more with Lynn. Um, she's probably the character of my heart, um, but Anna was the character I needed um, in some difficult times to kind of tide me through. So there's a character uh, in, uh, oh Jesus. So she has discovered my toes. Oh no. And she, it, yeah, she's at that. More orifices for her to chew on. Yeah, uh, so we have to bring her up. Um, but there's a character in my book called Belcalis. Um, and Belcalis is actually, um, because it's funny, I, I do think that Dakin and I share certain characteristics. We're both quiet, although I think after this pandemic, I'm no longer a quiet person. But now <laughs> I walked up to people, I'm just like, let me talk at you. I'm gonna talk to, let me just talk at you. Um, but Belcalis um, is the is, she is the type of person who, when she's mad, she says it. She does something about it. You know, she's just sort of she's a person who consistently calls out things as they are. Um, and she is the character that I aspire to be, you know? So like when I was writing The Gilded Ones, I was like, Dega is somebody that I hope to move from and Belcalis is the type of person that I want to be. Like, I hope to be the type of person who can see something and like say it, you know, instead of, because I think like culturally, um, I am just sort of taught to not, say things as they are. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's why I love that character. Um, and by the way, if you guys have any questions, please write something in the chat if you have uh, any questions at all. Yeah, I think we already have a couple. Um, oh, we do? Yeah, um, let's see. Girl, you know I suck at technology. <laughs> I see two. Um, I don't know, do you wanna, let's see. I, I don't even know where to find it. Oh, so I see. Adam says, ask ask question. A question. Um, okay, I think we can, I guess we can move to questions unless you wanted to talk. I do want to hear about, you know, writing a sequel, especially creating an oh. academic environment. I'd oh, love yeah. to hear how that was for you. Oh yeah, let's do that really quickly. Uh, you want to go first since you already have a completed. Sure, yeah, I'm past that now. Um, the sequel, I think, so for the, I don't know if people are familiar with publishing timelines, but basically by the time Blood Air was out, Red Tigress was written and I had started drafting book three. So, and I was working at the time, I was um, in finance um, and working a nine to five. And so it was the second book they say is the hardest to write. I don't know if you felt this way, Namuna, but for me it absolutely was because it was the first time I was writing on a deadline. I wrote this book over four years, no, three years, countless times. This one I had to turn in within months um, while launching this book and drafting the next book. So it was, it was a thing and I think there's, a, oh, and by the way, I'm charging my computer, so okay. I'm just listening. There's something to called the second book syndrome, which is when you know in a trilogy, the first book is the opening; it's like starts out with a bang, and the third book is you know the final battle, the climax, where everything resolves. And the second book is kind of like the stepping stone. So I really wanted to avoid that, and I've seen readers tell me that, like, thank at least they to my face, they're like, "There's no second book syndrome; like, it has its own arc, and the characters develop." Um, in their own way. So I was, I really wanted to set up a separate goal that kind of like went attached to like the whole series arc and put a sort of nesting doll of bigger and bigger arcs, both story wise and character wise. Um, so that's how I approached book two in terms of like a craft perspective. But definitely writing it, I, I have to thank my amazing editor, Krista. She really, really whipped this one into shape because without her, it, I think it would have fallen into the pits of second book syndrome. And yeah, so yeah, the second book was definitely the hardest for me to have ever written. Um, I think like there's definitely second book syndrome, um, primarily because like before, you, you are writing for however long you're writing and you're doing it by yourself. 
and now all of a sudden you have to start you have to start from scratch um, under a different system. So that's second book syndrome. But um, to begin with, for me, um, I like I'm on the second second draft, um, second rewrite of book two right now, and I I must say book two was awful to write, and it was awful to write because. Um, not just because of second book syndrome, but because it was the middle of the pandemic and not only that, the middle, um, the middle of the protests. And this was, um, as a black person in general, like it, it, it's, it was a heavy time and it still is a heavy time. But for me, there was the added thing of, um, I grew up during a war. So anytime there's things like protests or whatever, I, I, I am not okay, <laughs> you know, like I just sort of, and so I had to like actually deal with those, that, that sort of thing, like and deal with, um, deal with just that um, and learn to deal with it while writing book two. So which meant that book two just took forever and it was miserable. And I kept felt, and I kept feeling like I was failing everyone um, and finally, I had to like sort of talk to myself and be like, Namna, the reality is you have a different, you have a different um, up, upbringing and point of view than a lot of people and you have to be gentle with yourself. And so like once I sort of got that into my head, I was able to work through it and like finally I got book two out. But when I tell you it was, it, it, it was awful it was truly awful wow yeah i i honestly can't imagine and yeah i'm yeah just yeah. anytime there's protests just know i will immediately shut down and like mm -hmm. it's, yeah yeah or any or any type of unrest type things like i'm it's a wrap for me yeah i hope you're yeah. taking care of yourself um it's it's been a it's yeah. been a few years Oh, yes, it has. But, you know, I think that's one of the things is like these type of times force you to confront things head on mm -hmm. and work uh, through things. And so I guess that there's a silver lining. Um, but so we have three questions. Yeah. Um, what are you reading right now? Ooh, do you want to go first? Um, sure. Um, well, I'll tell you guys the things that I've truly enjoyed outside of your books, of course. Um, so books that I've really enjoyed um, that are out, out now, um, Ray Bearer by Jordan Ifueco, I'm such a fan. Mm -hmm. um, the Black Kids by Christina Hammonds Reed, huge fan. Um, Pregnant by um, Jenny and Ted, I don't know their different last names. That one's a movie, um, read mm -hmm. it, it's wonderful. Um, other books that I have enjoyed that are coming out that you guys need to have on your radar, Ace of Spades um, by Farida. Yeah. I'm dying to read that one. Yeah. I read that one in like the one of the first few iterations. So I, I'm so, I, I love that. Um, that's that's going to be such a good book, you guys. Um, Bad Witch Burning. Um, that was a phenomenal book. Um, what else? Um, Skin of the Sea. <gasps> um tasha my god tasha bowen mm -hmm. that's an amazing that that's an amazing book and i can tell you because i've read all of these and i've loved all of these um and the oh and of course um out now this is my america beautiful book um so yeah that's what i'm reading those are my recommendations i've been so excited for both ace of states and skin of the sea for honestly for so long um mm -hmm. I think Skin of the they're both coming out later this year. Um, yeah, so I think Ace of Spades is in June and June. Skin of the Sea is September, I believe. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and Very Much Burning should be coming out around June as well. Yeah. yeah. I think, oh, uh, one book that just came out, Which is Steeped in Gold by mm -hmm. Shannon Smart. I, yeah. I've literally been waiting for that one, I feel like, for years. Um, and it's sitting in my New York apartment along with all my other pre-orders. I have it right here. I'm so excited to dig, to dig in. Yeah, um, as well. So I'm currently reading this book, 
Uh, the Vanishing Half, I'm sure everyone has heard of this. Um, it is about two twin sisters. Um, I just started there. They grew up in a small Southern black community and then one of them um, runs off and decides to join a white community and another decides to dig deeper into her um, black identity. I it, it's it's been on my list forever. Um, I just started it and I'm loving it so far. Um, another one I recently read was Beasts of Prey by Ayana Gray. Um, I read an earlier iteration and then I got to reread it and it's amazing. I'm so it's excited a, for that one. Yes, it's, it's a pan-African fantasy um, set in a magical yet dangerous jungle um, and two teens who just, they're so funny and so true to how teens act because I will say my teens in my books act way older <laughs> than teens, but the way Ayana writes, it's just such a pure, like adolescent, like personalities. And they honestly just like sparks, sparks off the page. Um, so I love that one. It's coming out, I think in October this year, Beasts of Prey. Um, and then another is a book called How We Fall Apart by Katie Chow. It's an Asian American thriller. It's dark academia. Um, and it's honestly super just deceptive and deadly. And it's out, I want to say in June. So those are, yeah, those are my recent reads and truly loving them. Um, so I guess the next question is, what is the best, most valuable edit you've received on one of your books? That's a, that's a difficult and that's a great question, but also a difficult one. I don't even know how to answer, so I'm going to let you answer first. <laughs> Just throw the ball over. <laughs> yeah, I think every, honestly, every single of my edit letters have been amazing. Um, but I think just speaking to Red Tigress, um, this book was like re editing is basically rewriting and rewriting for me. I don't know if you've had the same experience, but I had to rewrite this book probably twice before um, it was in a good state. Um, and so my editor is super, super astute and she catches, she, ha she has just great story, vision for stories. Like she catches like all the development. She wants the pacing to be tight. She likes the arcs to kind of like lead into each other. Um, so honestly, the feedback, it's not a specific piece of feedback, but just all the feedback for this book that made me rewrite it twice um, was invaluable. And I think really just leveled it up to where it's it's a good story. Um, I don't know if this is an edit, but in general, one of the best things that people, well, my editors have told me is that my work is too episodic, um, meaning this happens, then this happens, then this happens instead of a co cohesive story. And so that's something that I'm working on and looking at. I'm like, oh, I see it there, the episodicness. So um, that's just always a go. You know, like what it is, is like there's things that you do that are your tics. Um, and I think like the best edit notes are when people point out your tics because there can be little minuscule things, but like in general, people tend to have patterns and I love it when someone points out, oh, this is your pattern and you need to work on it. So, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, absolutely. And then do we have, let's see. We have one last one. Okay, so I find your discussions very interesting regarding culture and society. As an aspiring author, studying a country's culture is very interesting to me. Many authors base their worlds on real countries, but in some cases, they're accused of cultural appropriation. When do you think authors cross this boundary and how can they avoid it? Okay, so I can go first. My principle for writing is that I want to portray something that is authentic and true to an identity or experience. And for me, I think that in a fantasy world and in our society, you know, there are so many people from different backgrounds and walks of life that, that should be in the story and they should weave the fabric of the story. But for me as a Chinese woman who is also diaspora and um, you know, regardless of like, you know, sexual identity, etc. 
the way I'm going to interrogate my own experience is through my own main protagonist. And I, if I attempt to, you know, write a perspective that is something I am, I have not lived in, I'm not going to be able to do it authentically is what I'm thinking. Um, and so while I love to incorporate characters of different backgrounds, um, you know, races, gender, um, sexual orientation, et cetera, I'm going to write specific to my experience. And that's just the rule of thumb that I stick to. Um, and yeah. Um, I think you said it perfectly. Um, I would also add that like, um, I think in general, one of the things is um, there are so many cultures where um, the stories have never been told or they have been told from the perspective of an outsider with an agenda. Like as an African person, I will say this, like one of the things that truly, a word that infuriates me in general is primitive. Because every time I read a book like Heart of Darkness or like any of these whatevers or Rudy, Rudy or Kip, whatever all these things are, it's always, oh, these primitives, these savages, these whatever. And even when people try to come at it um, in a good faith way, when they write about our experiences, it's also always from the point of view of somebody who's in the majority culture, culture sort of talking up and looking, looking at my culture in a way that it might not be the best. Um, I'm trying to figure out how to say this, but like basically um, I tend to be of the opinion that if a culture, um, there are so many of, there are so many authors, um, there are so many cultures where writers have not been able to write about their cultures for so long that I think um, that you know, marginalized writers should get a chance to write their cultures before anybody else. Mm -hmm. And mainly because, mainly because what happens is that there, as Emily said, there's a nuance in writing your culture that another person might not get, mm -hmm. or worse, that another person might might come at, come at it from their cultural perspective rather than what is actually your cultural perspective. You know, mm -hmm. so um, that's why I would say, I think certain things are sort of up for grabs and that the, we are so inundated by them that it is what it is. Like European culture is just, it is over, like it's everything, it's everywhere, the clothes we wear, how we wear our hair. Like it's just, we are, everybody's familiar with it, like the back of your hand. Mm -hmm. Like even if you're like growing up in West Africa, like I was, you're familiar with it, right? because that is the culture that everybody tries to assimilate to. But if it's a more marginalized culture, then people don't have that cultural familiarity. But then the other thing is the, the writers of that culture oftentimes do not have a chance to tell their stories. Like, I mean, look like, um, can I like, I'm just gonna lump you in with me and just say that like, it took to like, however long it took for us to actually have a chance to tell our stories because for so long our stories were not want like we're not wanted and we're not seen as valid. And so only now are we getting a chance to sort of step out and tell those stories. Um, so I don't know. That was a like a long and rambly answer. Yeah. It was I think it was so on point and I absolutely agree. I think that it's something that I'm glad to see publishing in general be supporting more writers from marginalized backgrounds and identities writing their own um, stories rather than having others tell it for them. And I think, you know, what you said about, you know, European culture, et cetera, being so prevalent and being the mainstream that everyone tries to assimilate into whereas marginalized cultures can often be represented in relation to these European, uh, I'm just gonna say colonizers and how they view you know, yeah. our cultures. Yeah. I think all of this relates to the global, like the structure of power globally. And every so, time sorry, go ahead. Yeah, because every time I read certain books, like I, I, I knuckle, like is it white knuckle my way through them? Like expecting to be like, oh, this is a problem, you know, because they're written from a oh. perspective 
um, that does not look kindly on where I'm from. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I think, yeah, I think writing with authenticity should be the main goal, but a step behind is not writing any, you know, problematic biases and stereotypes into an experience that someone hasn't lived. Um, yeah, that's so I think- That actually does harm. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, because I think there is something to be said about writerly ethics, because um, this is something we never really talk about. But I really think that, um, you know, artists should have ethics um, mm -hmm. because we inform how people think about things. Mm -hmm. And I think that there's a responsibility in that. Um, but on a, let's let's end on a good note. Can you tell <laughs> me uh, where to find you, Emily? Yeah, um, I am on Instagram and TikTok. Um, my meme brain has found its outlet. Um, but where are you really on? Where do you, where, where, where are you? What's your actual? Um, the social media platform? The, no, the, the one that you actually really use. Both of them actually. So Instagram yeah. a lot and then, to, yeah, both of them actually. So my username is at Amelie Winjow, just my full name on both of them. And you can either see, you know, cute pictures of me and my books um, and hopefully my future dog um, or memes that I make roasting myself and my YA fantasy stories. Um, so yeah, what about yourself? Um, I am on Twitter at Namina Forna. I'm on Instagram at Namina.Forna. And that's about it because like, honestly, and really I'm on Twitter because like I dip into Instagram and then I dip out, like dip, <laughs> dip. So yeah, really I'm on Twitter. That's where I'm most likely to like communicate. Nice. Cool. It was, I had so much fun chatting with you and honestly just listening to your experience and the themes in you writing The Gilded Ones. Like I love this book even more now. Um, and I'm super excited for the next one. And I'm so excited for like your entire trilogy. Um, I'm excited to read book two, which I will read after <laughs> rewrite. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. I forgot to click done answering on a question. Thank you both so much for joining us today. Thank you to everyone who watched. This was such a great conversation. And that really was a great question to end on. Um, just a lot of wisdom there. So um, that many writers I'm sure need to hear. <laughs> so thank you so, so much for joining us. I know it's Saturday and you just got your shot, but take care and rest up. And thank you both, Amelia and Namina. Thank you. Hi everyone, thank you guys for spending Saturday with us. Thank you guys. Independent Bookstore Day. Bye. Have a great weekend, bye.